Let me read to you a passage from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 43 to 48. It's the Gospel for Tuesday after the eleventh Sunday of ordinary time. St. Matthew writes, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's from Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. Our Lord refers to God as a God of love. What do I mean? Well, this gospel passage I've just read may be classed as one of the most distinctive and characteristic of Christian texts. If the average person, not particularly religious nor especially Christian, were to be asked, what did Jesus Christ teach? He would probably say that we are to love our enemies. He would think, and if he were among like-minded friends, he might even say that this is not very practical, but it is a nice idea and it would certainly make the world a better place if it were practiced. But there is a point that is commonly missed in this very text. It is that this demanding prescription, a directive that intends to bring to fulfillment the divine teaching given through Moses that we are to love our neighbour and hate only our enemy, reveals Christ's teaching also about God. We, God's children, are to be like God who is our Father, and God loves his enemies. His enemies are those who choose what is bad, sinful, and in violation of his law, whether natural or revealed. Such persons are not God's friends. They do not live in communion with him, but God loves them as their loving Father. This does not mean that they are not heading towards wrath. But this is because of their chosen and willful course. God is perfect in his love for them and for all. By his own authority, Christ laid down this completion and fulfillment of the divine Mosaic law. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Our Lord is revealing that this is what God is like, and we, as his children, ought strive to be like him in the special character of the perfect love that is his, to love his enemies. Christ gives an instance of this. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God's ongoing work of sustaining the world is a constant exercise of love, including love for the evil and the unrighteous. The distinctive characteristic of God is precisely love for all. So, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It is very easy never to come to terms with Christ's command to love and forgive our enemies and those who do us some form of harm. All our life we can remain unforgiving. We also can easily deform Christ's teaching on God as our loving Father, regarding him as merely benign and benevolent, not caring about our sins. Thus do we transform him into one who is not holy. But let us contemplate our Lord's revelation about his heavenly Father, who is our Father. He loves those who do not love and obey him. I suspect that this may be a most distinctive feature of the Christian religion, setting aside the many other unique features of it, such as the redemption from sin by the cross, 
the Trinity, the gift of grace, the Church and so forth. When we think of the myths and rites of classical, non-classical, traditional and primal religions, what deities are taught as loving those who ignore, disregard, disobey and even, even hate them? What deities love their enemies and expect their devotees to do likewise? One of the fruits of a careful study of the religions of man is the respect for those religions and the human spirit from which they have risen. One can even form the legitimate opinion that various elements in them have come from the divine spirit who continues to hover over creation, implanting seeds of the word in preparation for the word incarnate. While the Muslim regards the Quran as having been written, very literally, by God, and while the Christian refuses such a view of it, there is nothing preventing the Christian from being convinced that God assisted Muhammad in, for instance, his firm stand for monotheism. The details are a further matter. But what of Christ's revelation that God, his heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, loves all, even the evil and the unrighteous, and that we are to strive to be like him in this. That God does not love the sinner is abundantly clear in the Quran. Allah loves not transgressors. Chapter 2. He loves not creatures ungrateful or wicked, we read. Again, say, obey Allah and his apostle, but if they turn back, Allah loves not those who reject the faith. Again, Allah loves not those who do wrong. Again, Allah loves not the arrogant, the vainglorious. Or again, say, if you love Allah, follow me. Allah will forgive and will love and forgive your sins. The Quran appears strewn with verses such as these. The interested reader gets the clear impression that God is not presented as loving someone who does not love him, let alone an enemy of his. The first and fundamental thing is not God's unconditional and perfect love, a love that requires unconditional love from his children to others. This is not a point against Islam. In this feature, Islam, impressive as it is, is typical of the relig religions of man. In the Torah, we read that the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. Deuteronomy chapter 7. St. John, in his Gospel, writes that, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Chapter 3. In his first letter, John writes, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Chapter 4 And again, we love because he first loved us. First letter of St. John, chapter 4, verse 19. The foundation of the universe and of all things, seen or unseen, is the limitless love of God for all, including those not in communion with him. God does not hate Satan. If he did, how could Satan even exist? No, Satan hates God, for God is simply good and holy. This undying and irreversible hatred of Satan for God is what constitutes hell. Let us strive then with divine grace to imitate God in his love.